this is certainly the youngest person we've ever had speaking in this about their their recently completed book. But it is uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Julian Gortz here, um, and he has just written a wonderful book on a period that Jerry Cohen and I. Uh, just said we lived through when we were in China. Now Julian is kind of documenting the history, but it's um, uh, it's a, it's it's a terrific read, um, and I've now just discovered that it's an outgrowth of your college thesis. That's right, which I somehow suspected when I was reading. But that's <laughs> uh, that's the, which was good. <laughs> it's good. You should have published yours. It is being published, but um, <laughs> the. Um, You know, to have kind of, how long did this take? Uh, th to from start to finish. Yeah, about five years. Five years. I mean, it is remarkably detailed and remarkably well footnoted. I should say. I'm sure this was this was a very highly regarded thesis at Harvard. Um, but what's remarkable is that the issues that Julian talks about even though this is 1978 to 1993, it's issues which we're confronting today in China, that really the tensions that exist that you kind of lay out so clearly at the beginning are the same tension, or similar tensions to what is going on today. So what I'd love to do today is just, how long you want to talk for? Maybe 25, 30 minutes. 25, 30 minutes, okay, no longer. We'll, I will cut you off at 30. Yeah. and. Uh, then we'll have, we got a great group here, as I was pointing out, a younger group than what we normally have. Um, but we'll then have a discussion about great. what's in the book and then what's going on today in China. But Julian, welcome and thank you for producing what made for a lovely weekend of reading for me. Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks to the National Committee for having me here. And uh, Sure. And can everyone in the back hear me now? Okay, great. I'll, uh, if, I, if I drift, just, just wave. Uh, you know, it's it's. I should say it's a it's a real honor for for me to be here, especially at the National Committee in your 50th year, uh, because well, there are a few things we were talking earlier, and I was saying, you know, my ability to start studying Chinese young, start going to China young, uh, is in large part a result of the United States that the National Committee has helped to create, where there are Chinese teachers all over the country, uh, and there's public engagement in China. So. Uh, you really embodied the ideals that have proven right uh, in the U.S.-China relationship, and I hope will continue to. Um, and that's, of course, included supporting all sorts of exchanges uh, with China, of the sort that I'll talk about today. And one proof of that has been that pretty much every time I go into an archive of some Western expert who went to China, uh, there is a letter from Jan Barris, uh, <laughs> who has been at the National Committee since uh, 1972. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, and yeah, so it's uh, 71. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> right, pre pre uh, pre Nixon Mao. That's right. Um, so my book is called Unlikely Partners, uh, as you heard, and it, it focuses on an era from the recent past in China, from 1976, which was when Mao Zedong died, uh, to 1993, which is when the concept of the socialist market economy was enshrined in China's constitution. Uh, solidifying that a new system uh, had been built in the Deng Xiaoping era. And so indeed at the center of this book is uh, Deng Xiaoping who started uh, China's reform and opening in 1978 and remained the paramount leader uh, for almost the next 20 years. So when, when most people think of China, uh, you know, we imagine a society that has developed incredibly fast under an authoritarian leadership. And I want to take us back to before that happened. When my book begins, China had just emerged from the tumultuous and chaotic decade of the Cultural Revolution. China was incredibly poor with a per capita gross domestic product of only around 175 US dollars in, in 1978. So, when Deng Xiaoping became paramount leader, I think it's important to remember, especially for those of us who, who weren't around then, uh, that it was a real priority above all else to make China wealthy and powerful and to figure out how to do that. What would it take? And indeed, it, it really wasn't clear what it would take. 
uh, it wasn't clear even what the reforms should look like. You know, it's also easy, I think, as we look back to say that it was almost inevitable that markets would be the direction that the leadership would turn in and that markets would produce growth and that China, with over a billion people, would become an economic powerhouse. But, but in fact, and one of the things I want to talk about today is that it was, it was not certain that that, that would be uh, the path taken, whether China would pursue policies like those that Eastern European countries had tried, uh, whether there would even be room for the market uh, within China's socialist system. And my book centers on how China's leadership took what was at the time a, a very daring step and looked beyond their country's shores for economic guidance, you know, not just to Eastern Europe, uh, where socialist countries had experimented with, with socialist transition, but to Western Europe, Asia, North America, and beyond. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that China's leadership scoured the globe for new ideas, and their successes helped put China on a path to domestic prosperity and eventually global economic power. Now, Chinese economists partnered with a really wide range of, of figures. There were Eastern Bloc critics of socialism, World Bank officials, and, and Nobel Prize winners. And these figures, the, the foreigners, weren't uh, one directionally seeking to change China, uh, but rather to help China change on its own terms. And so, as the China hands in the room will know, I use that term to change China very specifically because there's an older model of, of missionaries and, and advisors, military advisors and uh, humanitarian advisors who came to China to do just that. And the great historian Jonathan Spence uh, has written a book about those efforts called To Change China. But I want to make the point right up front that this was a, a very different sort of exchange and interaction. China's rulers were in charge of this process in the reform period. They sought out Western ideas. They didn't copy them indiscriminately. But most importantly, they were open to new ideas. And China's transformation benefited hugely from this engagement. So I'll use our time here today to show you what this looked like in practice. And, and before I do, to set up some of what I hope we'll talk about in the q and I want to make just a brief case for why this history matters in the present. In, in China today, it's very clear that uh, the leadership under Xi Jinping is considering a, a turn inward, weighing the impulse to insulate itself from what they call hostile foreign forces or Western influence. And Beijing has introduced new rules designed to combat this influence. Uh, this is in the education system, whether promoting internet sovereignty in the country at large, or uh, even passing a, a law that got a lot of media attention uh, to regulate foreign non-governmental organizations, NGOs. And the demanding new registration requirements and increased monitoring uh, that, that came under this NGO law uh, were part of, of a larger initiative to limit contact between the professions and officials uh, in China and foreign experts uh, from around the world. The fan got turned on. So, should we turn the fan off? No, no, I okay. think it got turned on by accident. Oh, no problem. So, as we think about this trend in China today, I'd like to suggest that, that my research uh, might make us think that the costs of these policies are more severe than we appreciate in real time. You know, today, the Chinese economy's growth is slowing. Massive debt burdens have spread across the economy, and investor confidence around the world is newly uncertain. And what Deng Xiaoping and his lieutenants believed, and what I think is in question in China today, is that China succeeds not by limiting its connections to the outside world, but rather by opening itself up to new ideas wherever they may originate. So let's step back 40 years to a time when, as I said, China was not yet the global economic powerhouse that it is today. Uh, it's still a place where bicycles, not fancy foreign cars, clog the roads. And 
Deng, as I said, had set out, uh, along with his lieutenants, to make China wealthy and powerful under this policy of reform and opening. But by the mid-1980s, uh, they'd run into trouble. And they'd run into trouble in a few ways. First, state-owned enterprises, which uh, produced the majority of China's industrial output, were resisting market-oriented change. Growth was soaring uncontrollably, on the one hand a sign of success, but on the other hand inflation uh, was soaring along with it. So reformers and conservatives within the party leadership competed to provide solutions. And the crucial economic reformer is, is a man who's pictured here along with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, his name was Zhao Ziyang, and he served as premier in this period. And Zhao is an is a astonishing figure in many ways. He wrote in his posthumously published memoirs, and I'm just going to read you this quotation, my earliest understanding of how to proceed with reform was shallow and vague. I did not have any preconceived model or systematic idea in mind. And to meet this challenge, Zhao built up a network of economic experts who provided him with policy ideas. Zhao was open-minded and eager to learn from abroad, and this set the tone for his fellow reformers. Of course, conservatives, meanwhile, were pushing back and trying to maintain the supremacy of the state and the party. And this particular photo I, I think is revealing for a few reasons, but the main one is that you can see uh, that Zhao is an animated figure and that Deng Xiaoping is listening to him. And now, of course, he may just be pointing out a face in the crowd, but one of the themes of, I think, studying the 1980s in China is that Zhao Ziyang was himself in charge of many of the day-to-day -day decisions. Deng set the broader policy agenda. Here is another photo uh, of the leadership at this time. Uh, and I think that this photo is revealing for a few reasons, uh, but mainly I want to draw your attention to the generational divides that it indicates. So you can see really that you have at least two different generations represented here. Uh, you have the generation of of Zhao Ziyang, who's in the front row here, and Hu Yaobang, who's in the second row on the left, uh, comparatively younger. And then you have Deng Xiaoping's generation, Li Xianyan, uh, Chen Yun, etc. These are figures who fought in the revolution, who had been around during all of the history of the People's Republic of China from 1949 onward. And uh, as we'll see, the debate between conservatives and reformers also often took the form of a generational debate. So talking about openness and these other dynamics can, I know, be a bit abstract. So I want to dive into a specific story. And it's a story that's at the heart of my book. Uh, this is the story of a river cruise that took place in 1985. And it brought together many of China's top economic policymakers with a really amazing group of foreign economists from, from all around the world. And the story draws on research that I did in the personal papers of many of these economists, some internal Chinese government sources, as well as uh, interviews with, with many of the participants who are still living. So at this particular moment in 1985, as I've said, the Chinese leadership was struggling to figure out the direction for China's reforms, trying to determine what might be the best path for China to take after seven years of substantial growth, but growth that had not solved some of the fundamental contradictions and problems of the Chinese economy. And this delegation of economists offered real hope, the possibility of, of new ideas that might help China on its path forward. So the World Bank helped to organize this cruise. And their chief of mission in China was someone named Edwin Lim, and he invited a really diverse group of economists. And there, there are two names uh, that I want you to remember today. One is Janos Kornai, who was a Hungarian critic of socialism, uh, then teaching at Harvard. And the other is James Tobin, who was a Nobel Prize winning neo-Keynesian, who was a professor at Yale. And other economists came from Great Britain, France, Yugoslavia, Poland, uh, and West Germany. And here you can just see uh, some pictures on the top. We have Janusz Kornai shaking Zhao Ziyang's hand uh, as Edwin Lim looks on. And then on the bottom, uh, we have Jim Tobin uh, with Xue Muqiao, who was one of the elder uh, economists of China at that time. And so on the Chinese side, we really have a who's who of 
reform economists. I, I won't go through all their names, but uh, the most senior officials were some of the most prominent economic reformers in China at that time. Xue Mu Chao, who's, uh, who's pictured here, was in his 80s, had been a top economic planner for decades, became the kind of uh, elder protector of many of the reformers. An Zhiwen, who led the System Reform Commission, which is one of the crucial policy-making bodies, the president of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, a uh, man Ma Hong, and then also mid-career rising stars, names that uh, we still hear about today, like Wu Jinglian. And I'll also just note that uh, two of the most junior people there on the Chinese side uh, were named Lo Jiwei and Guo Shuqing. And uh, Lo Jiwei is now an accomplished performer. He served as Minister of Finance uh, until very recently, completing his, his tenure, and is widely regarded internationally as one of the most prominent uh, and internationally savvy reformers of his generation. Uh, the other, Guo Shuqing, has had a pretty remarkable series of jobs, chief securities regulator, bank head, uh, governor of Shandong province, and has recently been appointed to run China's banking regulator, where he has uh, kicked up what has been called a regulatory whirlwind. Uh, he has been incredibly aggressive uh, trying to fix China's banking system in just a few months. And they were the two youngest participants at this conference. Uh, they actually shared a room on board the ship, uh, the SS Bashan. And so here is a photo of just four of the Chinese participants. Uh, you can see Xue Mu Chao and Ma Hong on the left, uh, the elder generation, and then two figures from the younger mid-generation, Li Komu and Wu Jingyan. So, uh, and you can see the, I think, some of the excitement of this event for them uh, in the faces of these, these four men uh, who gathered there. So Premier Zhao uh, met with the visitors, and he asked their advice uh, on how to handle urban and industrial reforms. He admitted that the economy was overheated and said that uh, China needed the help of these foreign advisors to figure out the path forward. And this is a real tone of extraordinary openness that he set and that continued uh, throughout the conference. And so I really want to focus on, on two presentations today from the conference, those of Tobin and Kornai. So Tobin's presentation was Macroeconomics 101. It's a sort of astonishing fact that this Nobel laureate came to China and did not deliver a highly technical, uh, narrow economics lecture of the sort that he might be invited to give at the American Economics Association, but rather walked the Chinese audience through the very basics of what macroeconomic policymaking looked like in the West, how to manage aggregate demand, what a strengthened central bank might look like, and what it could do. And the reason for this is, is pretty simple. You know, it's important to remember that at this time in 1985, most of these Chinese economists had never studied what we might think of as modern economics. They had lived through the Mao era movements, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, but they had never studied at Yale or Harvard uh, they never had the chance to learn those things. And so Tobin delivered a crash course on monetary policy. And of course, in the room were many of the individuals who would later design and run uh, China's macroeconomic policymaking institutions. Now, Kornai's presentation was something different. Uh, Kornai had become famous as a critic of socialist economics in Eastern Europe. He began by describing the really basic facts of life under socialism. Empty grocery store shelves, only a few styles of clothing, uh, lengthy queues at every store. And he argued, his main contribution was that he argued that shortage, this chronic condition in socialist societies, was an inevitable, built into the system, consequence of socialism. So for China, Kornai advocated pursuing a policy of market coordination with macroeconomic control from the state. So Kornai was really saying that China should focus on the enterprises. Firms should be made to respond to market forces and instead of seeking only to please cadres who themselves you know, had the ability to forgive bad loans or to write off wasteful production. Competition, not paternalistic favors, would force enterprises to improve their performance. But acknowledging the kind of society that he was speaking to, Kornai did say that the state could still manage macroeconomic policy 
and regulate the economic and legal parameters of the market. So Kornai's words resonated. The prominent Chinese economist Wu Jinglian later wrote that it was there that he concluded that, quote, a market with macroeconomic management should be the primary objective of China's economic reforms. And I interviewed Kornai in Budapest, and he told me that he spent the night sleepless in his cabin after having given his presentation because he was electrified at the kind of reception that he'd received. So at the, the end of the conference, uh, one of the attendees, uh, a Scottish economist named Sir Alec Cairncross, wrote something in his diary, and I want to read it because I think it gives a sense of the attitude of some of these foreigners. He wrote, I have no doubt that they, meaning the Chinese officials, consider what to do very carefully before deciding and do not necessarily accept advice. So the foreign experts knew, they were aware in the moment, that they had met at China's request on China's terms. So immediately after this conference, the Chinese participants sent a memo uh, up to Premier Zhao and other top party leaders, and Zhao really liked what he saw. Later that month, in internal party meetings, he discussed the foreign experts' suggestions that China focus on its inefficient enterprises and used a term from Kornai's work, investment hunger, which refers to the insatiable appetite that enterprises have under traditional socialism for more inputs and more money from the state. And he said, we have to cure this disease, investment hunger, in China. And a public report appeared shortly thereafter on the conference and was widely read in China and helped provide wind in the sails to the reformers who were advocating new policies at this time. And then in 1987, at the historic 13th Party Congress, Zhao secured a central role for the once forbidden market in China's future. The economic system in 1987 was redefined as one, and this will sound a bit familiar, in which the state manages the market and the market guides the enterprises. So I should step back here and say that I really only intend the story of the Bashan Conference, this conference I've just described, as influential as it was, to be illustrative. It was one of a much broader range of interactions and exchanges in this period, which I write about in my book. So they really were meeting with an incredible array of people. Here you have Milton Friedman, uh, mm -hmm. who you know, is a real free market fundamentalist, uh, one end of the ideological spectrum even in the United States. Uh, meeting with Zhao Ziyang in 1988. Uh, so there was a real effort to learn from economists of all ideological stripes and regardless of national origin, uh, both from countries that had experimented with socialist transition, like Kornai from Hungary, and from liberal market economies. The core point really is that, that the Chinese leadership believed deeply in the value to China of these exchanges. However, as some of you will know, Zhao Ziyang's leadership came to a rapid end uh, just a couple years later. Zhao was removed from power for opposing the government's crackdown uh, on the Tiananmen protest movement in 1989. Deng had him placed under house arrest, and today, Zhao Ziyang's name almost never appears in print in China. The Communist Party takes credit for his achievements or attributes them to Deng. In the 1990s, uh, the reforms eventually resumed following the chill uh, after Tiananmen, and the economy soared. As I said before, the system that China built, a socialist market economy, uh, was enshrined in the Chinese constitution in 1993, and this cemented the enduring mix of state and market that had been developed in the 1980s. And all of these changes consistently drew on ideas from far beyond China's shores. So here you have Jiang Zemin, who uh, succeeded uh, Zhao Ziyang as general secretary, ultimately with uh, Deng Xiaoping in 1992, uh, later in the year after Deng's southern tour restarted the reforms. And of course, in the 1990s, China saw the rapid growth of the private sector while maintaining state-owned enterprises on the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, Zhu Rongji, who became premier and was the financial czar for much of this period, uh, oversaw ambitious reforms, as well as China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001. And by 2010, as you all know, China had overtaken Japan as the world's second largest economy by GDP. 
But I think it's important to say that the Chinese Communist Party tells a different story than the one I've told today. In, in that telling, the system of economic organization that China developed is stripped, yes, of the role of Zhao Ziyang, but also of most of its international influences. Instead, the tendency is to describe China's rise as a product solely or primarily of the party's leadership and on, in, in ingenuity. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, for instance, has said that the Chinese system, the, the socialist market economy, was grown out of the soil of China. And so according to that narrative, only a self-reliant China can succeed in the face of a domineering West. But I think it's important to bring the truer story of these collaborative partnerships into the history of China's transformation. If, if we leave it out, I think that we'll miss the tremendous value that China has derived on its own terms from wide-ranging and, and open-minded exchanges with the West. So I'll just offer a few uh, final concluding thoughts before we continue into the conversation. One of the reasons that I became interested in this project is that I believe that people both outside and inside of China need to tell positive stories of the rewards of openness. Engagement, as you all at the National Committee know well, takes time and patience, but people to people and expert exchanges from universities, the professions, and beyond can make a real difference. And I think without wanting to overstate it, this engagement can also act as a ballast that brings stability when relations hit rough patches. Of course, it's not close to the whole story of China's transformation or US-China relations, but I think it is an important part that's too often left out. You know, one recent area where we've seen engagement produce really significant benefits uh, to both sides is climate cooperation. Uh, and this is both, of course, at the expert level and at the senior leadership level. But to underscore the point that exchange is a two-way street, uh, right now we're living through a moment where it will be, it seems, the United States that will uh, be closing itself to cooperation on that front. Uh, at least that's how it appears following uh, President Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Accord. Still, I return to the lessons of history in assessing the present moment. A spirit of partnership was at the heart of the exchanges of the 1980s that I've discussed today. And those positive interactions were good for China and for the world. And they help explain why China's transition, at least until now, has succeeded when so many other countries' uh, similar attempts have stumbled. And I think we can't forget that in the 1980s, these exchanges were demand-driven, as Edwin Lim of the World Bank likes to put it. So it's, it's all the more regrettable that nowadays in China, the leadership seems to ignore a lot of the lessons of this form of really engaged openness. And as a result, I think that China risks missing out on the confidence-building effects of sustained interactions about new ideas. And worst of all, it risks intensifying the chilling effect on economic thinking and policy making within China. So we're at a moment where China is facing very daunting challenges uh, in its economy and beyond. May, in many ways, they're unprecedented challenges. And, and I believe, at least, that experimentation and innovation, uh, both among experts and among policymakers, is, is urgently needed to confront these challenges. So in a way, much of China's future will turn on whether its leaders once again allow domestic and foreign ideas to, to mix freely. And I guess I'd add just, just one final moment, uh, final note sort of about the present moment. You know, this question of openness and interconnection, as I was just saying, uh, not just in China, but, but around the world, in the United States and beyond, is being challenged more potently than ever before in, I think, any of our lifetimes. Uh, one of the basic assumptions underpinning US-China relations has been that openness and interconnection lead to stability and prosperity. And I think I, you know, we have to be, be honest that in nearly every area of our interaction, from trade and climate cooperation and you know, beyond, uh, Trump's presidency is fundamentally challenging some of those assumptions. Now, of course, this is well beyond my book, but I think it would be uh, arrogant not to acknowledge that we're facing 
an unprecedented challenge to the ideals of openness and interconnection that I've talked about today. So in that sense, the challenge for all of us is even larger because we have to be making this case at home at the same time that we're making it around the world in China and elsewhere. So that's all, and I'm really looking forward to having an exchange with you all. Thanks. And you stay to your time limit. Thank you. The last two sentences of the book, you know, talk about what you made reference to, which is, you know, Kornai's relationship with Wu Jinglian. And I didn't understand, let me just read this for those of you who have not had the pleasure of reading the book, but these, you know, in 2008 they, they have this reunion and they're, and they're together and you know, Julian describes, you know, they're kind of reminiscing and, and about, you know, 1985 and, and then a birthday, a birthday cake was brought out as the pair beamed. The two men rose from their chairs as if to give a speech. Then together they blew out the candles. What does that mean? I see, okay. <laughs> So, no, no, this is good. This is every author's dream, of course, is to be asked very specifically about their prose. Um, so, uh, there is a photograph, in fact, of this moment. This is not a historian's flight of fancy. Uh, they celebrated their birthdays together. And I thought that this was a nice moment to end on because you see that uh, Kornai and Wu Jinglian were not just two attendees at a conference once in the 1980s. They, in fact, had met before then. They'd met once at a conference uh, in Athens that Wu Jinglian had been sent to, and they hadn't really hit it off. Uh, Wu had spoken out supporting some of Kornai's ideas, but Kornai had never been to China and didn't really have a sense of who this Chinese economist was, whether he was some Communist Party uh, sort of figure with dubious intentions or not. And they stayed in touch. They actually became real friends, and I think have a real uh, intellectual partnership that has been mutually beneficial and rewarding. So. Uh, in 2008, which is the year, of course, that Beijing hosted the Olympics, uh, Kornai, who hasn't been to China in a while, but I think this was his last trip there, went to lecture and to see his friend, Wu Junglian, and they celebrated their birthdays together, and a birthday cake was brought out, and they stood up together and uh, blew out the candles together. So, But were, were you... Were, was there some message in the blowing out of the candles? Well, I guess, right. E so being, extinguishing being, yes, no, so kind being of the a, hope. Because right, the book is hopeful. Oh, no, okay, okay, well, I see. The, no, it's the jointness. Yeah, it's thank you, Jan. Uh, no, to me, the moment was a, was a sort of poignant one to end on because, you know, you have them. Of course, there's no extinguishing of hope, and I'm sorry if it's... I, I, in fact, hope that the feeling would be... Because the book is it's, it's very positive. I mean, it's that, US, that foreign... China cooperation has led to what China is today, and it's been yeah. very successful. Yeah. Okay, well, in the second edition, I will consider, <laughs> with a footnote <laughs> acknowledging Steve Orleans, a, a, you know, and perhaps, and then they decided to relight the candles and... Uh, and speak together. Exactly, and speak Say together. happy That's birthday. Right. That's right. What about the theory that because of the, in other words, because of the hundreds of thousands of students that have come to the United States, many who have gone back. So the old reliance on foreigners is no longer necessary because they have Chinese who have been educated at the finest universities of the world. And there's kind of, it's, it's no longer necessary and it's perfectly natural for China to rely on its own homegrown products. Yeah, I think that that's, to me, that's a source of tremendous hope uh, and, and excitement as you, you, know, you consider the future of China, that now, uh, really for the, for the first time, uh, there is a cadre of Chinese professionals who are educated up to the level of the very most sophisticated and educated uh, economists or other professions, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, and, they've gone, and many of them have gone back to China. Uh, many of them have gone into the private sector, uh, though, of course, not into the government, and it remains a uh, complicated topic for uh, the fact that, yes, the Politburo... When you say they haven't gone into government. Right. So many, so there is a small proportion that have been educated, you know, we're, let's say, on the Politburo at large, who've been educated internationally. Uh, in the West, it's an even smaller percentage, so we're now down to about 15, 
50%. Uh, there is no one on the standing committee who has been educated at a foreign university, I believe, other than in North Korea, right. which does count. Um, Jong the Jong. Right. Uh, but Kim Il-sung University. Precisely. Um, and I think one of the questions as we look at the 19th Party Congress coming up this autumn and, and indeed beyond is going to be for senior officials is having studied abroad viewed as a benefit, they have more expertise, they're up to international standards, or is it a liability? Is it, does it raise questions about their loyalty to the party? And this is, of course, a very uh, tense and ongoing uh, area of, of real dispute and, and variation. But I do think that more broadly, you're right, that uh, over time, it would be wonderful for foreign educated and, in fact, for Chinese universities themselves to be producing economists and thinkers uh, at the very, very top levels uh, internationally and to continue to fill out a body of expertise within China. But the fact is, at least in my experience, uh, many senior Chinese reformers want more deep engagement with foreign experts. They want to uh, not just be regarded by their international peers as of the same caliber, but actually to have the kind of exchanges of this era, which many of them refer to as a golden age. So are, are you see, in other words, the only data, as we talked about during yeah. the podcast, the only data that I'm aware of is data on the Central Committee So and the, and the alternates, so about 350 people. Right. And what we've seen in the last three party Congresses is it's moved from this is Chung Lee's book, maybe 8, 9 percent to 13, 14 right. percent to now 19 percent. Are you suggesting that it's going to drop for the 19th party? Congress? No, I don't think it will drop. But the question to me, the question is more. Uh, so the Central Committee, as you say, several hundred people. Uh, do we see figures? You know, so, so at the moment, when many people look at uh, China's economic policy apparatus, they look at the figure of, of Liu He as the exemplar of a top economic official trusted by Xi Jinping who has a degree from Harvard, a you know, master's degree in public administration. So to me the question is, do more figures like Liu He, who are educated abroad, who, in, who engage regularly with foreign counterparts, move into the Politburo and indeed even to the Standing Committee, closer to the, you know, the nucleus of decision making? or are, of course, as the percentage of educated Chinese who have degrees from abroad increases, that number, I hope, will continue to increase, but how much decision-making authority they have uh, is, uns is uncertain. When you see Xi Jinping travel abroad, yeah. he is surrounded by people who have been educated abroad. He really has got you know, what, Liu He is with him, Wang Huning is right. with him, Yang Jiechir is with him. It, it looks, you know, when you look at him and you look at the folks surrounding him, it's significantly That's right. folks who really have, have uh, spent a lot of time outside of, outside of China. That's right. And I think the, you know, the only thing that I would say uh, in sort of following on that is I think that is, that is excellent, though I don't believe that having a, you know, having attended for five years a U.S. university necessarily means that you are pro-openness or engagement. You know, I mean, meaning I think we can probably all think of plenty of, uh, sure. you know, so, but uh, what is to me a but really... But the chances are you are please. more pro-engagement. Yes, not every person yeah. is, but probably the data would suggest. Mm -hmm. I hope so. If you've studied in, we hope if you students study in the United States, they come to understand America right. and are more pro-American. Um, but we have got a spectacular crowd here. Um, so let me open the floor to questions, and I was sure Jerry Cohen <laughs> would be the first. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. And it seems very sound from what I remember, although we didn't have much contact with the high-level mm -hmm. economic theorists, the overall planners. But we provide the material for your next book, which is at one level lower, mm -hmm. the practical yeah. economic cooperation that involved the legal system yeah. and the relationship between law and foreign investment right. in China, which was so crucial. The Chinese were so preoccupied with the need to earn foreign exchange in order to finance their modernization that everything was interpreted in terms of foreign exchange. 
And I remember in December 1980, I think it was, we were at a dinner given by Pan Am to celebrate the opening of the first international airline coming to Beijing. At the Great Hall of the People. First time they rented out the Great <laughs> Hall of the People to earn foreign exchange, wow. which I thought was a little too far. <laughs> and in the middle of this very nice dinner came the tragic news from New York. John Lennon had been assassinated. And that put a damper on the evening. Hmm. Gradually, the people at my table tried to say something appropriate to the sad news. Hmm. And I was seated next to a vice minister of foreign trade. And when he felt it was his turn to speak, he said, that man earned a lot of foreign exchange for his country. <laughs> Amazing. Now, what, now I, Jerry, can I, can I add my memory of that dinner? Sure. I'm surprised. Do you remember the, the gift that was given for every attendee at that dinner? I don't. It was a clock. A small clock, which was incredibly bad judgment, because uh, the Chinese in the room Pan could. Am gave it. Yes, but Pan Am gave. We all got these little clocks. And it's so cold that it's an That's right. It, it was it was prescient, but it was. Uh, go ahead. I think the thing to emphasize is the Chinese were self-confident, even though they were not learned in what it takes to attract foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And they were being advised mostly by UN advisors, beware of the multinational companies. You can't trust them. Look how they've exploited Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, even Raymond Vernon, my colleague at uh, Harvard Business School, he wrote about beware of the hmm. multinational and one of my dear friends, a lawyer, Sam Stern, who was sent out by the UN to talk about technology transfer, he told him, don't trust the kinds of people he made a living from as advisor. Mm. <laughs> and the Chinese ignored that. Mm. They were confident that they could benefit from what the foreign multinationals had. They admired the oil companies. We represented Amoco, among others then. Chinese just soaked up every bit of learning they could get. Yeah. And I remember one day we had a program to get the tax people together with the oil people to talk about oil taxation. And I was seated next to the National Tax Commissioner, our dear friend, Mr. Liu Zhichang. And Amico brought out a wonderful oil tax lawyer from Washington, and he was impressive. And Leo whispers to me, is Mr. So-and-so paid by Amico? And I felt he's worried about a conflict of interest. Right. And I had to disclose. I said, yes, he's paid by Amico. And you better take that into account. And Commissioner Leo said, good, then we can invite him again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They wanted the mm -hmm. advice. They That's right. couldn't pay for it in foreign exchange. Yeah. This was at Jurongji. I don't know what you've come across in Jurongji, yeah. but he was a level below That's the right. high level economic parlance. But he was dealing at yes. the practical level as the man running the economic commission. Yeah. Uh, he had to deal with the foreign investment program. And I remember in 1987, the UN had its first conference to review the success of China's attempts to involve and import foreign direct investment. Yeah. And Zhu Rongji was in charge of that. Hmm. And I remember, A, how much he wanted foreigners' help. B, how much he hated the Japanese. Hmm. <laughs> because he said, there is a country that refuses to invest in China. Right that refuses to transfer mm. technology. They only want to trade with us and benefit from that. I felt that was so unfair and so wrong because I represented many Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke out. I figured, what the heck? <laughs> All he can do is throw me out of China. Right. And I said, you have to look at it from the point of view of the Japanese company. I described the case 
that one of the major Japanese auto automobile companies had, Honda in Chongqing. And when I got through telling about that case and how the local Chinese factory absolutely violated the contract, et cetera, et cetera, Yurongji, instead of criticizing me, he kept quiet. And mm. two weeks later, in the People's Daily, there was a report of a speech he had just given saying, if we don't observe our contracts, no yep. one will want to invest in us. And we had many experiences like that with Schindler yeah. Elevator, the first joint venture of a significant nature, yeah. industrial nature in China. Uh, this was an exciting time, but I think you could do a sequel <laughs> yeah. in, in terms of the legal aspects, because that story hasn't really been told, and uh, there are many, I think, uh, amusing anecdotes. Yeah. I love your presentation, Thank you. and I love your linking it to the present struggle in China, where there is a struggle between those who want continuing international vitalization and exchange, and those who are trying to close it off. It's not clear how that struggle will go, and if you look at the law, for example, it's a messy situation, right. because you've got evidence on both sides. Right, that's right. But congratulations. Thank you. But Julian, Thank you. how many? The book really talks about the cyclicality, yeah. you know, that, that all of this, as we've seen over the last 40 years, there's this, there's this cyclical, are we just, taking that to today, are we just in one of the normal cycles? And yeah. that, you know, whether it's after the 19th Party Congress or sometime later, that will go back into the more pro-opening, more pro-reform cycle. That's right. I think that's, so... What you describe is, is exactly right. As you know, historians and scholars think about the reform era in China, you talk about a you know, fang shou, you know, basically a tightening up and then a letting go in that cycle. And I think that one of the big questions for all observers of Xi Jinping, and there are prognostications uh, in both directions, and I think there's increasingly a sense of the limitations of prognostication of any sort, is whether we are seeing a tightening up uh, that will then be followed by a loosening, or whether we're seeing something different, whether we are seeing the uh, beginning of a different direction or a different era uh, in China's reform process where that tightening and loosening is no longer going to be uh, the oscillation that the system goes through. And I think that if you remember in 2012 or 2013 when she was being elevated, uh, there were all sorts of media reports that he was going to be the great economic reformer who China had been waiting for, that his agenda was bold, he was powerful, he was the son of Xi Jinping, you know, who had been such a dynamic reformer during the 1980s in Guangdong, and that, uh, in fact, you know, Xi would himself, of course, immediately become the new architect, which was the media term of the next era of China's reforms. One of his first trips domestically was to go to Shenzhen and to lay a wreath uh, at the foot of the statue of Deng Xiaoping striding forward that overlooks the city. And then, of course, we, we haven't seen that, at least over the past five years. And one of the big questions uh, that your question, that your question you know, really points to, I think, rightly, is, is Xi Jinping accumulating power, eliminating opposition, and weakening vested interests so that, following the 19th Party Congress, he can launch into a golden age of uh, market reform, uh, and legal reform and other sorts of uh, liberalization, or is he developing, as recent uh, Communist Party statements would suggest, a new theory of governance, a new way of governing China, uh, in which the cyclicality is no longer the defining characteristic, but rather a kind of consistency that uh, leads on the one hand to tightening of control domestically and on the other hand to an increased global stature uh, where China can champion its own definitions and its own version of economic globalization and, and openness. Uh, if I had to prognosticate, which I will do though, historian, and you know we're not supposed to do that, but uh, I would say that it's the latter, uh, that it is that second path. Um, but I think that it's structural, not so right, that we are seeing a structural shift, or at least we're seeing an attempted structural shift. Uh, but I would love to be wrong. Uh, I would, yeah, I think. Attempted is good. Right. I'm very doubtful whether the pendular 
movement that has marked so much yeah. of Chinese development will stop. That's right. I think five years down the line, the pendulum is going to go exactly. back right. again That's right. in a more hopeful way from our point of view. That's right. And I think the pendulum, I think it's less clear. I'm, I'm not a believer that reform has simply stopped. Yeah. I think it's a much more mixed picture. Sure. There are certain areas where right. there has been incredible reform. That's right. You know, the reduction of, of impediments to starting businesses has been enormous. And if you talk to Nick Lardy, as you cite him often yeah. in the book, he will say that the private sector That's right. is going gangbusters because of wiping out. Well, you know, when Jerry and I were fir first there, you know, the requirement for registered capital to getting 25 chops before you could start a business, it's gone. That's right. You just go and you start it. It's like a Delaware corporation in the United States. It's simple. So business creation, which is private, not state-owned, mm -hmm. is, is um, proceeding very rapidly, and I think the same is true in law, Jerry. There are areas where there is progress, and there's areas where there's, you know, That's right. where they're going backwards. And there are millions of people waiting for the pendulum to start That's right. swinging in the other direction. That's right. In the meantime, they're doing the best they can. That's right. And some of it is impressive. Some of it is only impressive at the level of principle or of legislation, mm -hmm. regulation without much implementation. Yeah, yeah we, were, we were talking earlier, and, and one, one thing that I've at least come to believe is that you know, we don't need to think of reform or openness or any of these sort of liberal ideas as a kind of binary on-off switch, but rather as a sort of a dimmer, where it can be dimmed down a little bit, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's, but that, uh, so and at the moment, I would argue that we are seeing a dimming, but that doesn't mean, it, I mean, as, as you both say, you know, it's certainly not turned off, and frankly, China is so uh, intertwined in the global economic system and so conscious of the need to maintain investor confidence, both domestically and internationally, that uh, they, I think, are very aware that if the perception becomes that reform is being really reversed, that huge backward steps as opposed to just slower forward movement uh, are being taken, that, yeah, there would be real international instability triggered by that. Bill. Yes. Uh, my compliments. I, I guess, yeah, I'm Bill Einbruster, retired journalist. Um, I, I gather that Dad Zayan clearly was the second most important person after Deng, um, at least during the 80s. So after the book even suggests there, uh, can I say that? The, the, the Zhao was as important in as a lot of ways during his period in right, power, right. that he was really implementing and coming up with the ideas, right. and Deng was okay. at 30,000 feet. Right, okay. And so after he was purged, Also, um, did, when did Zhu Rongji then ascend to, the, my recollection is that he was the primary economic That's primary right. Economic. So, what, yeah, so one of the arguments that I make is that by the time Zhao Ziyang was purged, he had managed to uh, really establish a lot of the policy direction and, in fact, even start implementing some of the substantive policies that uh, would really power China's development in the 1990s. So in that sense, it wasn't necessary economically that he still be in power for those policies to be executed. So one example of this is what he called the Coastal Development Strategy, which was developed uh, in 87, 88. And basically, this was a policy where there would be these key coastal areas drawing on the success of the special economic zones. They import uh, inputs and raw materials, do manufacturing and production domestically, and then export. And that that would be a way of power and growth throughout the economy. Uh, that had started to happen under Zhao, but it was really in the 90s that under Zhuangzi and Jiang Zemin that that became the engine of China's growth. Uh, so in, in that way, Zhao's presence itself was not uh, necessary for some of these policies to be implemented. There was a, a slowdown or a retrenchment after Tiananmen, uh, both for domestic and international reasons. I mean, this was uh, the nearest the party felt it had come to an existential threat. It was, of course, in a global context at the end of the Cold War, where uh, instability in the streets across uh, the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were showing these party leaders what uh, the consequences of instability could be. So 
there was definitely a brief slowdown, though, in fact, I mean, reform did, uh, reform policies returned in the early 90s, and even during that, uh, you know, it's often talked about as, you know, a chilled period, uh, there was still tremendous production and growth that was able to be very quickly ramped up after Deng's southern tour. Uh, and then, yes, as you say, Zhu Rongji in the 1990s, uh, even before he became premier, which is in 1997, uh, was the chief economic czar from, I think, really, he became, I think, vice premier in 1991. Uh, I can check that. But, uh, and he had been running Shanghai, and he, uh, you know, with Jiang Zemin, and the two of them were, in many ways, uh, quite complementary uh, in running the economy and, and the party. Uh, so, yeah, so, so there's definitely, I think, more substantial continuity between the 80s and 90s uh, than, than is often characterized, despite the fact that Zhao, Hu Yaobang, and then even Deng himself uh, retreat from the scene for various reasons. Thanks. Right here. Yeah. So just to maybe take the Americans, um, where there was a real, I think there was a real spectrum of, of answers to that question. So on the one hand, you had people like Milton Friedman, who thought of themselves as evangelists. I mean, he really, Friedman uh, was, was shocked when he was invited to China for the first time, uh, because, which was in 1980, very early, because he had been so critical of communism and of socialist economics and even of China itself. But he saw this as part of his global spreading of the free market gospel. Definitely, you're right to say, in a, in a Cold War context, uh, you know, he saw this as part of the battle against uh, the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, spreading neoliberal ideas in that way. On the other hand, someone like uh, James Tobin or many of the other uh, sort of more Keynesian economists who went to China in this time I think that they were motivated by a combination of factors. You know, Tobin, when he was invited, there was a letter that I found that he wrote explaining why he was going to the head of the Yale Economics Department because he had to, like, you know, he'd get excused from class for a couple weeks or something. And uh, he did not make a case about the need to spread ideas. Uh, he said he thought it would just be fascinating that he said, you know, he said, China is this huge country where we've had very little intellectual interchange at all. And it can only be for the good to have some of us go and meet them and maybe bring some of them here and to start this kind of exchange. And I mean, those of you who were involved in the exchanges at that time, I think can probably attest that yes, some people saw what they were doing perhaps as part of a Cold War project of going to Red China and uh, trying to convert them. But at least from the sources that I've read, the dominant feeling is that the Chinese are undertaking a huge experiment of their own, and we want to understand what's going on there, and if we can help, great. Uh, so I do think there's a mix. Um, and I think, you know, in, in all of these exchanges, you know, I said, I said it earlier that, you know, the old model of the missionary or the to change China model isn't right. Now, of course, in some cases, those, that's exactly what people thought they were doing, but I really think that the spirit of collaboration is not just window dressing. I think it was, in this period, it was, it was real and it was a, a motivating factor for a lot of people. Did any of the Western economists, you see, looked at their papers, did they, any of them foresee that China would succeed the way it has? That yeah, it would so have an economy that exceeds the size of the United States, or PPP, it already does, soon it will by any measure. So simply put, no. Uh, I think that, you know, the, uh, when, when Friedman went in, in 1988, he gave a lecture actually which was attended by uh, Justin Lin or, or Lin Yifu who had got, who subsequently got his PhD at UChicago and was then the chief economist of the World Bank. And Friedman said that he thought that the Nobel Prize should go to any uh, economist who could explain how what had even happened by 88 was happening. He just thought it was so inexplicable. Uh, 
Now, of course, partly because it didn't fit with his view of the world, but also, uh, you know, I mean, still is a fascinating question. And, and of course, after Lynn wrote saying, you know, I volunteer uh, to answer this question and get a Nobel Prize. But uh, the, the, the truth is that very few of these economists understood, you know, at that point, or, or could predict, I think understand maybe is unfairly judgmental. But at that point, the idea that a country of China's scale could successfully embark on socialist transition and not l produce complete economic chaos, that was the key test where people did predict, okay, China actually seems like it might be able to make this transition. The idea that that transition would result in, as you say, you know, one of the world's largest economies soon, without question, the world's largest economy. Uh, no, I think it was not until the 90s when people began to, at least in what I've read, uh, become aware that this was possible. And frankly, I think one of the dynamics that we see at play in the United States today is a continuing uh, sense of astonishment and in some cases even fear about this somewhat inexplicable rise of China. Um, so I think it remains a really confounding phenomenon to a lot of people. Right here. Do you think that similar... Or Identify yourself and speak loudly. Sure. Hi, James. Um, do you think that similar or dissimilar factors are driving um, the isolationist, we could say, or maybe inward-looking impulses that we see in both the states and China? Similar impulses. Uh, also, do you think the do you think the factors are driving you know because in the U.S. and China there you know, there are people who are more oh, isolated okay. looking, and then there are factors who are you know there are others who are more you know perhaps more isolationist, more inward looking. Do you think that the factors are driving the, the people who are more isolationist and the isolation forces? Do you think there's similar factors or dissimilar factors that are driving? Well, I mean, I think that there are definitely some surface similarities, um, but to me. The, the biggest difference that motivates why I think the factors, you know, the root factors are a bit different is just that, you know, we're two countries that come from very different starting points in, in all of these questions. So in China, uh, the primacy of the state uh, under traditional socialism was the core fact, the beginning assumption, and then every move toward the market had to be justified. Uh, whereas in the United States, I think quite often it is the market forces that are the core sort of liberal idea, and then every state intervention needs to be justified. Now, of course, we have a long history of those kinds of state interventions, so you could say post-New Deal, that's no longer the case, but uh, I think in people's mindset, uh, at least in the leadership's mindset, a lot of the impulse toward protectionism in the Chinese context feels like a desire to preserve uh, the Chinese economy, to protect uh, Chinese workers who have been uh, left out of the benefits of globalization and growth in the United States. A lot of the impulse superficially appears to be to protect, same thing, to protect Chinese workers, I mean American workers who've been left out of the benefits of globalization and growth, but that actually the systems, the policies that might be uh, brought to bear and the international context are hugely different. Uh, for the United States, it means uh, withdrawing or pulling back from an order that we've helped to create. From, for China, it means withdrawing or creating alternatives to an order that they feel they, yes, perhaps were invited into, but not on terms quite befitting their own self-image uh, or the realities of, of growth. So I think that you know, continually, despite those superficial similarities, I at least feel like, yes, the, st the starting points are just so different. Um, that each similarity gives way to a series of really important distinctions. Have the Chinese, how have the Chinese responded to this book? Have, have friends read it Chinese who kind of say, yeah? Or said, what are you, crazy? Sure. So I think that there are a few things. So first, uh, the history of this period in China is, is not very well known right. to begin with. Uh, so I think that, you know, in my mind, the, the greatest contribution of this book potentially to a Chinese reader is to walk them through the history of elite policymaking in their country in a way that isn't often done, you know, where there are some texts that have appeared in China that do uh, give this kind of overview, but uh, to sort of really understand how contested at every moment 
the potential for reform was in China. And then I think more broadly, I mean, of course, there's a bit of a selection bias in that many of the Chinese people who I'm talking to are the ones who want to engage with a foreigner. Uh, and so there is certainly, uh, I mean, I certainly have heard positive and encouraging things about the value of this message, but being realistic, uh, I think that there are real limitations on that in term, in the Chinese context. I think that there are limitations on uh, the audience for a book that subverts elements of the official narrative at a moment where that official narrative is being strengthened so profoundly, at a moment where the crime of historical nihilism, meaning advocating views about history that are different from the official views, uh, where that is being talked about in a very mainstream way. So. Uh, I'd like, I mean, I would love it if Chinese readers were able to engage with it and benefit from it, but uh, I think that there are real limitations there. Is it being translated inside or outside China? Outside. I figured. Yeah. yeah but in... In to Mandarin. Genti, it's a simplified character. That is very much the hope, yeah. Um, but whether it's, whether it's in simplified or traditional is... Yeah, you have to assume that the treatment of Zhao Ziyang, which is very favorable, would not allow it to... Correct. ...to, to be circulated in an official capacity, but my guess is unofficially they do translate it and they do circulate it. Um, you know, the question, the period that you're dealing with is really, it touches on the fall of the Soviet Union, but really is substantially before it. And the reason that the Chinese have become so suspicious of Western influences is their analysis of the fall of the communist parties of the Soviet right. Union and Eastern Europe. So how do you kind of, how do you talk to them? How do you fit the narrative of the helpful um, Westerners with the narrative which the Chinese Communist Party is now, has taken as, as the correct narrative, that it was Western influences, Western NGOs that um, led to the overthrow of these communist parties. Right. Well, so I think there are a few, uh, a few ways that you can make that case. One uh, is to begin by taking economic growth and to say that the Soviet Union never figured out how to grow economically in the way that China has now been growing for decades and has been growing in partnership and in interconnection with the outside <laughs> world. That is the fundamental basis of China's success. So rather than saying the fundamental basis of China's success is the strength of the state, fundamental basis of China's success is its economic growth, its interconnection with the outside world, and that that has happened in partnership with the wider world. And so that for other key policy areas, that same spirit can have crucially positive results. And I think one instance of this being done really successfully, as I said earlier, was in climate change, where for a long time there was huge Chinese resistance because of exactly this, it will look, it will be destabilizing if we admit that our environment is polluted. It will be destabilizing if we are forced to do things by foreign uh, or international organizations or foreign governments to reform uh, and to help mitigate the problem of, of ecological crisis. But uh, in large part because of the fact that it was impossible to continue denying that uh, pollution had become a reality in many Chinese people's lives, there was a real wholehearted embrace of the you know, global governance system around climate change and partnerships with American scientists, American NGOs, etc. And so I think it's going it, to the, the path forward, especially in the current very constrained circumstances you know, on both sides of the Pacific, is going to have to involve looking for those areas where uh, Chinese interest can be defined positively as being advanced by cooperation and then by attempting to, in a way that is very clear about its intentions, i.e. not peaceful evolution, but it being very uh, clear about the need for these initiatives to continue moving forward because they benefit China more than they benefit any other party around the world. Which is a perfect note on which to close the program, but this is... Um He's going to stay around a few minutes. The book is outside. He's going to stay. Julian's going to stay around a few minutes to sign it. But thank you for adding so, you so much, much to our knowledge of this. Thank you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.